we're going to have a few remarks from some of our welfare participants. They'll talk to you a bit about business and financial management, and then we'll get the symposium going. So I hope you're ready for uh, an informative day, and we, I look forward to the presentations, and I hope you all are as excited as I am. So welcome, welcome again. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, the Race and Wealth Inequality Program for just inviting us. My name is Avery Jones. I'm hailing from uh, the Black Business Network Exchange, uh, where we are a social enterprise to build black businesses uh, within the community uh, around DC and metropolitan area. Uh, some of you received uh, some items on there on your seats, but more information about what we do um, can be found on bbnetworkexchange.org. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you guys are sleepy. Good morning. <laughs> so my name is Jessica Taylor. This is Ian Smith. Uh, and we are going to be right over there. We are with Primerica Financial Services, or PFS Investments. So we uh, are a financial brokerage that works with everybody. We come from an educational approach. So we sit down and teach people about the basics of how money works, um, we're, which is we're really excited about being here today for people who kind of want to figure out how to get out of debt sooner or maybe start saving for retirement, maybe even setting money aside for a kid to go to college, a family member to go to college. And we do all kinds of other stuff as well. Um, but we will be right over there. If you're interested and in, in not here, the website is uh, primerica.com slash Jessica V. Taylor, that's me. <laughs> and uh, if you're here, come by, get some candy. We can't wait to meet you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Geshi Karuri Sabina. Uh, I hope I'm the person from the farthest. I'm here from Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, based on <laughs> linkage with uh, uh, Professor Chris Marsh here, I was really excited to hear about this conference. Uh, we are in a context where everything is about race, uh, as too is inequality. And uh, so what I've got here are a couple of posters that she suggested that share on some of our work. And uh, I'm with an organization called South African Cities Network. So we study cities largely. And the connections we've been trying to make are largely around the relationship between space and the space economy uh, and racial inequality and how does one change that up. So I think you'll see on some of these posters some commentary about space and race, uh, but also about inequality and poverty in our context. Mm -hmm. And I'd be more than happy to chat with anybody about the kind of research we're doing. Uh, I'm mainly here to just learn and soak it all up. So please feel free to share all of your ideas and research with me as well. Thank you. So we'd like to thank all of our welfare participants. Please feel free to stop by and speak with them um, sometime during the day. They'll be here for your convenience. And two things I wanted you to take note of in your chair. The first is the program. And so the program um, tells you a little bit about the Critical Race Initiative, Congressman Mitchell, whom the symposium is um, named after, and the order of events, as well as panelist bios. And also, feel free to read with us. We've created a reading list based on the panelists' work, um, more recent work on racial wealth inequality. So I wanted to point you to that. Those are some resources that you can use to help you digest what you begin to hear here today. And we will begin in just a few minutes with the panelists. And so again, I want to welcome you all and thank you for coming. We're very excited to have you today. <laughs> 
Also of note, you have an index card, and I know you're probably wondering why do I have this blank index card. What we'd like you to do is write your comments and questions down, and we'll take them up toward the end of the panel so that we can use them in the Q&A, and that's how we'll conduct the Q&A. So thank you very much.
All right, good morning once again. Oh, come on, give me a little bit more. We've been here for hours this morning. We are like high on coffee. Good morning. All right, so I'm uh, Dr. Rayshon Ray. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Sociology, and along with Dr. Chris Marsh, um, help to run the, uh, the critical race initiative that we have here. Good um, morning once again. Oh. My live stream is literally playing. Well, that's a prelude to say for people who are joining us online, thank you for tuning in at your office, at your home, at uh, some particular coffee shop that I'm sure will come up uh, at some point in time today. Uh, thank you for joining us online. Thank you for those of you who are here in person. We appreciate you joining us today. We hope that you'll be able to stay for most of the day. We have a very exciting uh, set of panels lined up to talk about racial wealth inequality, and in particular ways that we might actually ameliorate some of the inequalities that we actually see. Um, it's kind of my, my honor to mention, again, Congressman Perrin Mitchell, which this symposium is named after. This is our fifth annual symposium. And with this particular symposium, every year we have a different theme. This year is about wealth. And Perrin Mitchell stood for ways that we create more equity and the ways that we actually reduce inequality. Congressman Perrin Mitchell was the first uh, African-American congressman from the state of Maryland, uh, actually one of the first in the South since like uh, right after slavery during Reconstruction. Um, he was also the first African-American to obtain a graduate degree here at the University of Maryland while taking all of his courses on campus. That happened in the, in the 1950s. And what's key is that he got that degree in sociology. So our parent, Mitch, yeah, I think that's a clap. Like, I mean, it's just pretty amazing. And I think part of the reason why it's amazing is because the chair of sociology at the time actually testify because, of course, we have to remember it was separate and unequal, separate and equal schools, schooling, supposedly, but really we know it was separate and unequal. And the chair of sociology actually testified at the time to say, um, no, Perrin Mitchell cannot be in graduate school and get the same degree that his white classmates are getting on campus in class together at College Park by him sitting in a room by himself in Baltimore. Again, this was before live streaming and technology. There's no way to kind of virtually do that. They were literally sitting him in a room by himself. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Shanna Bruton Tion, who was here, who was one of the graduate students at the time, working with Dr. Patricia Hill Collins, who collected all of this archive data for us on Perrin Mitchell. Um, one of the things Perrin Mitchell stood for was small businesses. He stood for economic development. So kind of in that vein, we have what we're doing today. I um, also want to acknowledge our, um, our essentially our, our co-organizers for this panel, Dr. Chris Marsh is one. You'll hear from her later today. Um, she is actually um, at an important breakfast that she's running from with Dr. Judy Dalamini, who traveled all the way from South Africa to share with you uh, at the lunchtime panel. If you haven't heard of her, she is now uh, one of the wealthiest people in South Africa. And she lived during apartheid, and she has a PhD, an MD, an MBA. She is simply a phenomenal person. You all would not want to miss that either online or here in person. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Joey Brown, who you heard from earlier, who's over here on the corner. And I think we have to give it up for Joey because he was recently awarded a Ford Foundation Dissertation Fellowship. Congratulations, Joey. One of the things people don't know about the Ford Foundation is that the Ford Foundation fellowships are actually more competitive than the National Science Foundation fellowships. So Joey is one of the select 100 of pre-docs, dissertation fellows, and post-docs in the country who got selected for that. So congratulations, Joey, and his work is centered around uh, racial wealth inequality. Um, next year, the theme is going to be centered kind of around family, gender, and sexuality. Dr. Don Dow is going to be leading that next year. Raise your hand, Don. All right, thank you. And so be ready for that in 2019 as we kind of continue this. So again, if you're in person or online, we appreciate it. What you have before you is a program, um, some additional information, reading materials, but you also have an index card. What we want you to do is throughout the time of this panel is to write down questions that you might have. And we're going to have people come around. I think it's Chandra and Paige and Kelsey are going to come around and gather those, uh, those index cards um, toward the end of, of kind of each speaker and then the moderator will use those. So it's my pleasure to, to really get into it and introduce our, our first keynote speaker. Dr. Thomas Shapiro is the director of the Institute on Assets and Social Policy. Um, he's also um, a professor of law and social policy at the Heller School for Social Policy at Brandeis University. Professor Shapiro's primary interest is in racial inequality and public policy. 
He is a leader in the wealth and race field with a particular focus on closing the racial wealth gap. I can say that um, emphatically. In fact, I was telling him he has a book uh, with uh, Dr. Melvin Oliver um, entitled Black Wealth, White Wealth, which literally changed my life in graduate school. Like I sign it in basically everything that I do and I tell people, if you wanna know what's going on with wealth, you read that particular book. Um, but of course, there are others, I think what he'll be talking about today, um, including toxic inequality, how America's wealth gap destroys mobility, deepens the racial divide, and threatens our future, which was uh, just released last month in March, uh, or last year, last year. Um, and so with no further ado, Dr. Thomas Shapiro. Good morning, everybody. It, it is indeed a pleasure to be here for a whole host of reasons, um, not the least of which is, is in honor of, of Perrin Mitchell and all the contributions of uh, the congressman, the businessman, uh, the educator uh, to the university and the community. And it, it's a real honor to, to stand up uh, today at the fifth annual symposium in his honor. And I also would like to thank the, uh, the great folks here at the University of Maryland. Uh, uh, Joey, congratulations doubly and triply, um, and for, for all the work that you've done to put this together. Uh, the Critical Race Initiative and the sponsors, the university sponsors and the community sponsors. And I kind of want to take, um, as a starting point, one of the, uh, one of the sentences out of the uh, Critical Race Initiative mission statement, if you will. Um, that says, we address the ways that race permeates social institutions to maintain systematic forms of inequality. And as a sociologist, that's, that's what my work has been about, and that's what I really want to focus on this morning. Uh, the chart, I promise you, I think, just three charts, <laughs> three, three data points that I really would like people to visually think about for the conversation, uh, not only for this morning, but for the rest of the day. And, and the rest, of the, rest of, uh, of the future for American democracy and democracy elsewhere. So in the United States, um, I think we can date um, to the early 1970s a basic fissure between what had been the case from post-World War II up until the early 1970s, where wealth grew, that is where the productivity of the society grew, the average hourly wage also grew basically in tandem. And that's a story. And the story is that no matter what the level of inequality was, growth and that prosperity was shared. And that long 27-year period of economic prosperity in the United States, um, the living standard basically doubled for just about everybody. And that was relatively shared for a lot of reasons that we're not going to get into today. Sometime in the early 1970s, that shared prosperity came to a pretty dramatic and abrupt end. And you can see from the chart, as wealth continued to grow, as prosperity for some continued to grow somewhat dramatically, it was no longer shared. And it was no longer shared as evidenced in the hourly wage that American workers received. And that's where um, the point at which both wealth and income inequality in the United States really starts to spiral. And there are a lot of reasons, and maybe in the question period and the rest of the day, those are some of the themes that we might want to really dig into. Um, toxic inequality means several things for me. Uh, primarily, it's a way of conceptualizing and thinking about where we are in the United States today as something that is pretty different from where we have been in the United States. Now, I know we're live streaming, but I, I want to tell everybody to turn the sound off for half a second, because I'm going to say inequality is not the issue. Inequality's always been with us. The issue, rather, is about who bears the brunt of inequality, its magnitude, its harms, and its danger to the rest of the society. And so in the era that we have been in, I would suggest for two to three decades now, 
basically dating back to the early 1970s again, we have been in an era, an approaching era of toxic inequality that is featured by a number of things. Historic highs in both wealth and income inequality in almost no matter how one wants to measure that, at least as far back as the reliable data will take us. Stalled mobility in the living standards of normal American families where clearly some few families in the socioeconomic order are doing a lot better. Most are uh, working harder to stay at the same place and other folks are doing worse. And we see that also reflected in that av average hourly wage, which is showed a little bit up and down, but it's a basic story of, of stagnation. Added to that, those basic processes of inequality that are widening in the United States is a dramatic and growing racial wealth gap, and I'm going to come back to that and spend most of my time this morning uh, delving into some of the data um, and some of the pathways through which that occurs. Intersecting with that, of course, is the demographic change, uh, a long process that the United States is in the uh, part of going through, where the demographers tell us that now sometime by the year, it's been pushed back because of Trump now to 2044 or so, um, United States will be a society in which no one racial or ethnic group will be a numerical majority. And that's happening already um, in different spheres in the society. Um, education, for example, elementary and middle and high schools. Uh, it's happening with uh, uh, 2040. 15, I believe, was the first year that there were more babies of color born than white babies. And so against the, the dramatic shift in those demographic notions, you see inequality widening. And it has a very firm racial and ethnic basis to it. And then lastly, as part of the framework that I want to uh, call to everybody's attention, prior to this last election, Pandering to racial anxieties and racism has been with us as if I would suggest a foundational part of American economy and American culture. And that racism and, and anxiety has been ratcheted up clearly during the last electoral cycle and continues to be so. And continues to be a strong thread that is both melding that fabric together and tearing it apart at the same time, depending upon where folks are. So let's get into the racial wealth gap. Um, you've seen chart one. There are just two more to go. <laughs> um, what you've got in front of you is data that from a nationally representative survey, a cross-section, one point in time, that looks at the median wealth Half families are above, half are below. The median wealth of white families is approximately $171,000. Everything that they own of material value minus all of their material debts gets us to net wealth. And for African Americans, that same figure at the median is about $17,600. And for Hispanics, it's about $20,000. Now, just a, one point of uh, a quick comparison here. This is about wealth. If this data were put up about income, the average at the median um, uh, African-American wealth is a, uh, income is about 60 cents on the dollar for every dollar of income that the median white family has. So when the, par when the paradox of income and wealth is looked at, Income is about 60 cents on a dollar, white to black. For wealth, it's about what? It's about a dime on a dollar. So that tells us a number of things. It tells us that wealth is much more unevenly distributed, if you can call that a distribution at all. And it leads, I think, to a whole host of questions, starting with how do we get to a dime on a dollar? What is it in our history, our legacy, in our set of institutions, in our policy that gets us to that place? And then, oh my gosh, how do we get, how do you talk about parity? 
What are the solutions to that? And we need to think very boldly, very dramatically, and I would suggest in a very transformative way. All right, so that's the, the basic baseline is that chart there in terms of looking at, in a cross-section, nationally representative survey, net wealth, white, black, Hispanic in the United States. And maybe, I'm not sure, maybe later in the day, uh, my good colleagues uh, in the last panel might lay in some of the data about some other, some other ethnic groups as well. Um, but I want to turn now our attention to um, another set of data, last set of data, promise. That is when we ask and think about the question, all right, the racial wealth gap, um, if we understand history at all, and if we understand a little sociology, and if we throw in a lot of economics, we might begin to understand um, that the baseline is different because of that history, because of the history of slavery, because of the history of Jim Crow, because of a whole host of American policies around the Homestead Act um, and a whole bunch of other grand policies that excluded families and individuals of color, but built wealth and homesteading and businesses and human capital for others, primarily white families. We have that whole history behind us. But that leads to a different set of questions, if you will, for me. And one of the questions it leads to is, all right, if that racial wealth gap opens up at a dime on a dollar or whatever you want to say it opens up at, over time, in a theoretically post-racial era in the United States, post-1960s, hard-fought, hard-won social movement victories that led to fair housing laws, opened up higher education, opened up some communities to different kinds of homeowners, shouldn't it be the case that the, whatever the racial wealth gap was, that over time it closes? That would be a post-racial society. The data, unfortunately, I put the data up already, the data tell us a very different story. And I want people to um, look a little bit carefully because this is data that follows the same set of families from 1984 um, up until, in this data set, up until 2013. So we're not looking at one national survey in 1984 and a different national survey with a totally different set of families in 2013. No, we're following the same set of families. And that allows us to really, I think, focus in on the question, what happens to the racial wealth gap as the same set of families are now experiencing American society, American culture, American policy, maybe not the same set of schools, definitely not the same set of communities, but what does that experience all culminate into? And for dollars that are just, adjusted for inflation, this is what the data tell us. The data tell us that in 1984, the gap, just white, black, that gap, median to median, opens up at $84,000. Adjusted for inflation, that gap by 2013 widens dramatically out to $245,000. Something very dramatic, very deeply, profoundly, institutionally is happening that allows that gap not to close, which would be a best case, not even to stay steady, which would be a stagnation, but to actually get worse, the same set of families. All right, so we were able to then look and try to begin to do some analysis that asks the question, what's going on there? What's operating? And this is what we came up with. And again, what we're looking at is what explains the difference between that $84,000 gap and its widening to $245,000. Now, there is a bit of a conversation that has been going about the role of housing justice in the United States and the racial wealth gap. And I want to continue that conversation. That's how um, pushing each other in a lot of ways, that's how we learn, that's how data gets challenged, 
that's how I think we come to sharper ideas and sharper conclusions. In this analysis, by far, the leading pathway to widening the racial wealth gap among the same set of families over this period of time has to do with the equity that's accumulated in their homes, which account for a little over a quarter of that, of that widening racial wealth gap. Now, I don't want to stop with that statement, because stopping with that statement, I think, would be an error, because as my good colleague Derek would point out, home ownership is a composition of wealth. And so, you know, in, in, in regression speak, it belong, you can't put it on both sides of the equation. <laughs> um, but it is both cause and consequence. So this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit more about how it is that home ownership and the rise in home equity is a leading pathway of widening the racial wealth gap. For me, it brings in three important sets of legacies and policies. It brings in history. When people buy a home, they bring with them or don't bring with them inheritance earned from previous generations. They bring their prior wealth with them and if they do that, they are able to get a smaller loan. And with a smaller loan, they can pay fewer points. The interest rate they can pay also can be lower. That is, the cost of borrowing money can be lower if you bring more wealth to the table to begin with. Right, so that, that's partially where legacy comes in. And if you remember some of the data, if we even go further back in time, uh, we can suggest that the African-American ratio to white wealth was not a dime on a dollar. It was probably a lot less than that, given the history. But at that mortgage table, not only is that history and that legacy brought to bear, they're the contemporary, at the moment, discriminatory processes that occur. And they occur largely because of the Federal Housing Administration, because of the way the financial industry historically has lent money to people of color at greater price, and where those financial institutions and realtors have encouraged the steering of families of color to residentially segregated neighborhoods. Also a part of our history, part of our current, if you will, uh, persistence in residential segregation. So all that is happening, but that's not all. And I think maybe one or two of the uh, subsequent panelists will dive into this a little bit uh, this morning or this afternoon as well. When families buy homes in residentially segregated neighborhoods, that home increases much more in value if that home is located in a upper middle class, a middle class, relatively homogeneous white community than if that home were located in a middle class community of color, much less a lower or working class, and much less if it's a, a central urban community. And so wealth then is also projected, that projected rise of wealth into the future is tagged to residential segregation. And that's the way that, partially the ways that housing equity works. Right? Now, I'm not up here to say that, you know, figuring out, untangling all that mess is, is a solution. But I am here to say that it allows us to look at what I consider to be a very deep structure that is thoroughly embedded with racialized dynamics that is a pathway to widening the racial wealth gap. And I think that that, that chart up there gives us, some idea, gives us some idea of that. Other dynamics there in that chart include not just the, the home ownership equation and pathway, but it also includes the value at which whites are 
their investment in education, their investment in increased income at the job converts much more readily to wealth than it does for African Americans. So in looking at the data, what the data tell us is that similar educational achievements, similar gains in income over that period from 1984 to 2013, for every dollar of additional income that whites get, it converts into something like four to five dollars more wealth per dollar. The same increase in income for African Americans converted to like 90 cents of wealth per dollar. Right. Now, a lot of labor market dynamics are operating there. Uh, access to pensions are operating there. Retirement savings are operating there. Um, student debt is operating there. There are a lot of things that, that, that go into that. And so all of those factors, um, including, and the others I'll throw in quickly, uh, family and kinship networks and inheritance also play a large role in adding up to how you get from $84,000 gap to $245,000 gap. All right. So um, I want to talk just a little bit in, in some of the remaining time about how uh, past and contemporary policy preserves racial injustice and inequality in the United States. And let me start this with just going back quickly um, and reminding us of some of our history here. And I referred once already to the Homestead Acts immediately before and immediately after the Civil War in the United States. It was, um, for historians can differ about you know, why, why, it, why it was enacted, but essentially helping to settle the West, uh, helping to settle the West from indigenous peoples, helping to expand the, the uh, uh, United States empire at the time. The deal was if you could show that you could earn a living and built a shelter that you lived on on a piece of land the government would give you title to that land. Incredible. Um, one of our colleagues, uh, Trina Shanks, estimates that up to one quarter of American homeowners or property owners can trace to their families uh, their original homes to the original Homesteading Act. Now, I don't know if that figure is right, but it's it, it's pretty dramatic, it seems to me. All right, that act in its Implementation and by its design ex took lands from Native Americans and excluded families of color. Right. A great opportunity for homesteading, for jobs, right. middle of the 19th century. Um, I don't want to go through the whole history. The, the last one I want to talk about just briefly before we go to contemporary policy is the Social Security Act um, because it's one people often uh, the dots aren't often connected. When the Social Security Act is proposed and then uh, enacted in 1934-1935 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, meant to um, supply some modicum of senior economic security for people who retire, who are injured, or who are disabled, or whose families are disabled among workers. And it wasn't supposed to be the only, uh, uh, the only nest uh, for retirement or economic security for seniors, but it was the, the government social insurance system that was set up. Um, I would suggest in grand design, probably not a bad scheme. Um, it's worked pretty well over the years, with the major exception that it named occupations that would be excluded. So it's the mid-1930s. Um, uh, the, the exclusionary mechanism wasn't to say African Americans couldn't participate, Hispanics couldn't, um, indigenous peoples couldn't. No, what the exclusionary mechanism was was to name occupations. And it named occupations where African Americans were largely concentrated, agricultural workers. Hispanics, uh, Mexican Americans in particular, concentrated as agricultural workers as well, domestic workers. And railroad workers was a different statement. It's not until two and a half decades later that agricultural workers were brought into the system. And the story about domestic workers is still a little, a little sketchy and not exactly enforced. A major policy system that provided some modicum of, uh, uh, 
of risk aversion because some part of one's future was accounted for denied to African Americans. So whatever they had to save for themselves in their future, um, it was on their own. Contemporary policy. Um, and I just want to focus um, on, on one or two here. Um, uh, in the tax code of the United States government, there is um, something that some of us call a wealth budget. And it's essentially incentives um, and subsidies for behavior and things we do that help us build wealth, buy homes, and save for our future. And we get tax exclusions for that. It's about $400 billion a year. Half of that, about half of that, is um, sub federal subsidies basically through the tax code that allow families to buy homes by taking the interest they pay on their mortgage off of their taxes. Now, we won't get into the, the, the current reform of that, um, because that, that'll get us into some uh, different stories. Uh, maybe we'll get into that a little later. But about half of that $200 billion a year um, goes to families that subsidize, and there's no other word for it, subsidize home ownership, arguably for families that are going to be homeowners anyways. 80% um, of that or so, of that $200 billion a year, goes to the top 10% of income earners. So it's one thing to think about a $200 billion housing justice investment somehow that spreads across the population. It's another thing to think about it if 80% of it goes to the, 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 the top 10% of income earners. Um, and then lastly, um, one of my favorites that really, uh, really burns me up is the estate tax. Um, and that's currently gone through some reform as well. Um, I like to cite one piece of data about this to begin with. Um, we've, you've heard over the years probably a lot about the estate tax, um, positive and negative and abolishing it or making it stronger. The reality is that out of every 10,000 deaths in the United States, two of those will have left enough money to be eligible to pay the estate tax. Two out of 10,000. That's what we're talking about. So it's a very specialized piece of, of legislation. The, the, until the, the current law was broken again, um, for an individual, $5.4 million was excluded. And then dollar number one, over $5.4 million was taxed at 35%. Not the 5.4, <laughs> but dollar one over the 5.4 million. So it, it applies to very few individuals, and the, the actual rate is very different. A number of us have lots of ideas um, about what to do with that and where that money um, uh, should be engaged, whether it's in baby bonds or whether it's in reparations or whether it's, it's in reinvesting in the next generation or back into communities. Um, lots of people have their hooks into that idea, <laughs> and I think you'll probably hear about some of those later as well. Um, let me just finish with um, one other quick piece of data here, and, and the slide I put up digs down a little bit into the mortgage interest deduction. Um, and uh, maybe as a sociologist, it, it's interesting if we were to go out, not of course at the University of Maryland, because people are very, very well educated here and in the community, I'm sure, but if we were to do a survey and ask people, what's the housing policy of the United States government? Um, 9.5 people out of every 10 undoubtedly would say it's subsidized housing or public housing projects. Uh, because that's what the narrative has been telling us. That's what the drumbeat has been telling us about housing policy in the United States. We spend as a society about $40 billion a year on subsidies and public housing. We invest as a society about $200 billion a year in home ownership for families that arguably are going to be homeowners anyways or that already are homeowners. $40 billion versus $200 billion. The housing policy of the United States government is housing home ownership subsidy primarily and to a much larger degree um, helping some families in some modicum way to, uh, uh, to get them to affordable or to decent housing. 
uh, despite the fact that our numbers um, are still very, very great in that, in that way. So let me end here, since we're talking about race and wealth, let me end here with another, um, another set of, a quick set of findings from some work we've done. Um, the data that I cited earlier about uh, who gets the $200 billion a year a home ownership subsidy comes from tax data. And it comes from analysis of tax data. And for better or worse, um, when we file taxes, race is not something that's on those forms. Right? So it's been very difficult to look at that $200 billion a year for the mortgage interest deduction and ask the question, what's the racial and ethnic distribution of that? Now, we came up with a way a kind of back-ending it, looking at people who'd actually taken the deduction from national surveys, knowing from those surveys what the demographics are, and came, come up with the following piece of information. Um, close to $10 billion a year um, would go to families of color, and about half of that is African American, the other half Hispanic families. Close to $10 billion a year would go to families of color if the mortgage interest deduction reached down into families that owned homes but didn't qualify for one reason or another, or if the mortgage interest deduction were somehow demographically and, demogra and democratically distributed. That's an action, an action of harm, if you will. And the final point I would leave is that's another example, I believe, of how what looks like non-racialized policy, by intent or not, and I could, you know, I could make the argument it is, but by intent or not, has the profound impact of widening racial injustice in the United States while uh, propelling the widening of economic inequality at the same time. So, um, you know, I guess as the beginning speaker, you know, I've looked at, at the rest of the panels, and I, I knew I would be um, not off the hook, but I knew that some of the ideas around solutions were going to come in the next two panels. Um, I just hope that I've teed things up enough, and I thank you all for your, your attention this morning. We want to thank Dr. Shapiro for that presentation. Wow, like such eye-opening information. Talk, talk about toxic inequality. I'm going to ask the, the rest of the panelists come up now, and I'll introduce them while we're here. Um, Don't worry, not everyone that came up is a panelist. So we actually have three other panelists. Um, the first, well, not the first, but Dr. Cedric Herring, who you see here, is a professor of sociology and public policy, a Habrowski Innovation Fellow and director of the Language, Literacy, and Cultural, Cultural PhD program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He has published nine books and over 80 articles on race, diversity, and inequality in journals such as the American Sociological Review, the American Journal of Sociology, and Social Problems. A former national president of the Association of Black Sociologists, Dr. Heron was awarded the Joseph Himes Lifetime Achieve Achievement Award for his scholarship. He has received support from the National Science Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and others. Dr. Lauren Henderson is an assistant professor of sociology and Habrowski Innovation Fellow at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Her research interests include diversity issues, stratification and inequality, health disparities, and race, class, and gender and sexuality. Among her recent publications are Credit Where Credit Is Due, Race, Gender, and the Credit Scores of Business Startups, and the Review of Black Political Economy, um, Wealth Inequality in Black and White, Cultural and Structural Sources of the Racial Wealth Gap in Race and Social Problems, and Dr. Henderson is an elected representative on the executive committee of the Association of Black Sociologists. She has made presentations of her research before government agencies, in the media, and the United Nations. 
And also we have Dr. Louise Seamster, a, postdoc a postdoctoral teaching associate at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She received her MA and PhD in sociology in 2000, 2016 from Duke University, and an additional MA in liberal studies at the New School for Social Research. Her work focuses on race and political economy, particularly, well, she didn't receive them both at the same time. I know y'all laugh. She received her PhD in 2016. Um, she is the co-editor of several special issues on race and politics and has published in ethnic and racial studies, political science and social theory, social currents and sociology campus. And without further ado, I'm going to welcome to the stage, Dr. Cedric Herring. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be with you, and I want to thank Joy Brown. I also want to thank Dr. Rayshawn Ray and Dr. Chris Marsh for having me here. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I want to talk about the racial wealth gap, just like other people on, on the panel, and I will acknowledge that it is important for us to understand why the racial gap exists and we have already seen some of the information about how large it is and that it is widening. But today I'd also like for us to talk a little bit about some of the consequences of the racial wealth gap and to show uh, some of the impact, especially on African Americans, not just at Starbucks, but at other places in our country. Uh, and so in doing that, what I'll talk about is some of the different kinds of ways that wealth protects whites and how the lack of wealth actually does harm, especially to African Americans, but other people of color also. And so um, in the time that I have remaining, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about a study that we have launched uh, in Baltimore metropolitan area, and that actually could include some of you from Prince George's County, Montgomery County. I, you know, I don't know if there are people here who are from there. Uh, but also, you know, um, areas in the state of Maryland. And as we know, Maryland is quite a wealthy state. And so some of the numbers that we're talking about uh, will look a little bit different from what they look like nationally. Um, so this is basically uh, data that we've collected this year. And so these are very recent data. And what I'll be able to provide with you, uh, provide today are preliminary results from a study that we conducted. And let me just say some things about the study very quickly. Um, it consisted of, and actually I found a little trick here. It consisted of um, 1,500 residents of the Baltimore metropolitan area. But in tandem with that, we also conducted um, a study of roughly 750 residents across the United States. And so even though our focus today will be on Baltimore, uh, later we hope to be able to make some inferences also to the nation. Um, we also can talk about the fact that uh, we measure wealth similar to how other people have measured it in other studies, the survey of consumer finances, but more directly, we talk about it's being, how it's modeled on the panel study of income dynamics, which is a source of data uh, for wealth and wealth inequality. Um, and so what we'll talk about is how we also collected data on other aspects that deal with people's quality of life. And I should also give a bit of a shout out to number one, the Rabowski Innovation Fund that did fund the data collection and, and things like that, but also our collaborators who are in the audience, uh, Dr. Sandy Darity and Dr. Derek Hamilton, um, who have entered into an agreement with us about data sharing and things like that. And so um, we hope to move forward on that partnership. Now let me talk a little bit about um, some of the kinds of things that we found. 
and to talk about two overarching research questions that are guiding our analysis. And so like I said, like other people, we are interested in the racial wealth gap and the magnitude of that and trying to understand uh, what the sources of it are, as are a lot of people across the country and some of the foremost scholars um, in the world who are studying that kind of issue. In addition to that, though, we also want to know about the consequences of the racial wealth gap. And so um, we'll talk about that. Very briefly, and not in much detail, I, I just want to show you some of the magnitude. And so this is a graph that tries to show, and I'm not going to get into the chicken and egg, which creates which. Wealth creates some of these things. Some of these things are components of wealth, as you heard earlier. But this is basically a graph that says, if African Americans and whites had the same characteristics, and they also had these characteristics in common, that we would see, for example, African Americans and whites who have stock ownership, the gap is $400,000 difference, whopping. That's with people who have the same characteristics. Chicken and egg, yes, yeah, so this becomes a source of wealth, but if you are looking at people who are the same, it is saying that they are different that much in terms of wealth. And you see other things. So I don't, I, I would refer you to the article that was published in uh, uh, Race and Social Problems under the special editorship of Thomas Shapiro. And so we were happy that that was in that volume. Um, let me move on. And let me talk about um, some preliminary results from our current study that shows the relationship between wealth and treatment uh, in the criminal justice system. To do this, I want to talk a little bit about the distribution, the composition of racial categories. And so when we talk about wealth, it's one thing to talk about. So as Dr. Shapiro talked about, uh, we take the assets that people have and we subtract from it their liabilities. And so what that gives you is a category of people who have quote unquote negative wealth. That's people who are indebted. But as uh, Louise Simster will tell you, they're not all the same. Some people have extreme debt. Our, form, our, our current president, who called himself the king of debt, and it's not all bad. It doesn't mean that they have a horrible lifestyle, <laughs> right? Because you can have, it means that you can sometimes leverage that. And so not everybody who is indebted is poor. But most poor people are indebted. And when we're talking about the composition of people who have less than $50,000 in assets or, or net wealth, net worth, we're talking about 47% of them in our survey are African Americans. And when we're talking about people who are negative wealth, that 40% of them are African Americans. I'm not going to say that we therefore can think of when you see the, the gray or the dark shaded thing, that you're looking at African Americans, but it becomes almost synonymous. When we start talking about, on the other hand, people who have what we might think of as being wealthy, a million plus dollars, more than $1.5 million, you see that disproportionately those are people who are white. And so when, we, when you start seeing these next charts that I'm talking about, again, I'm not going to say that that means white people, but disproportionately it will mean white people. So when we start talking about these kinds of consequences, and I know that I, I better speed it up, but when we start talking about some of these consequences like, for example, being stopped by the police, when we see people who have less than $50,000 in wealth, disproportionately, those are African Americans. And as you see, as wealth increases, 
your chances of being stopped by the police do what? They decrease. And when we start talking about people who have more than a million uh, dollars in net worth, again, not all of them are white people, but disproportionately they are white people. And their chances of being stopped by the police are substantially less, less than half. When we start talking about things like people who are incarcerated, you see uh, that this net, wealth, net worth uh, category that we're talking about, negative wealth people, we are talking about 13% um, uh, of them, oh, I'm sorry. And in contrast, again, we see that as wealth increases, the chances that you will have a family member who is incarcerated decreases substantially. We see also the same kind of, we see the opposite kind of pattern in terms of people who have credit ratings. It increases when we are talking about, she, she needs the cane to pull me off, but I, I will get down. I'll get down in just a moment here. Uh, we see this kind of pattern when we're talking about foreclosures. It's racialized. No surprise to people, I know. But just how racialized it is, we're talking about uh, twice, the, twice the rate for people who are typically black versus those who are typically white. When we're talking about health care, seeing a doctor, we see that African Americans are people who have less than uh, $50,000 in net wealth. Um, it's about 40%. And in contrast, when we're talking about people who have roughly a million, it's less than, three, it's, it's a third of that. When we're talking about health, again, you see these patterns. College, the ability to have parents who pay for your college. It's related to wealth, obviously, but it's also racialized. That's what we see. In terms of having to change your plans about college, also we see the pattern that is very much related to wealth, and it is also racialized. And so with that, I'm going to be more fair to my uh, other panelists and say, Thank you for your time and attention, and we look forward to questions. Okay, so good morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Joey and uh, Dr. Ray uh, for inviting me and uh, Dr. Marsh as well. I'm so excited to be here, so I'll go a little faster just to keep up with the time. So um, I would like to share some of our research on racial and gender differences in business startups, credit scores, and lines of credit. An often overlooked factor in wealth accumulation is that of business ownership. So it is well known that business startups face challenges in securing credit. But above and beyond the normal concerns about lack of access to financing, women and minority applicants may be concerned that they receive even less favorable treatment from lenders that is unrelated to their credit worthiness. Critics have questioned the accuracy and the fairness of credit scoring models. They charge that in some cases, credit scoring is inherently biased against minority groups such as blacks and Hispanics. Cohen Cole, in his work in 2008, for example, found that lenders set credit limits on revolving accounts based in part on the racial composition of the neighborhood in which a borrower resides. He concluded that, quote unquote, it appears likely that a race variable appears somewhere in the determination of credit availability. In contrast, proponents of the universalistic model of credit worthiness suggest that race and gender have little or nothing to do with the credit scores of businesses once firm characteristics such as company size, business net worth, that is equity, 
industrial sector location, legal firm, form of the incorporation, and history of the company are taken into account. Despite the importance of this topic and the vast amount of discussion surrounding the value of a good credit score for small businesses and consumers alike, researchers have paid scant attention to it. We have two research questions. Do the race and gender of new business owners affect their credit scores? So that's our first question. And controlling for credit scores, so once we take credit scores into account, do the race and gender of new business owners affect their access to lines of credit? We use data from the Kaufman Firm Survey, a nationally representative sample of startup businesses in the US in 2004. We had a sample of 4,900. The data include demographic characteristics, previous startup experience, and other financial information of the owners and their business credit score. So um, individuals have a credit score, we all have a credit score, but businesses also have a credit score. So for the sake of time, we're just gonna skip and go right to the results, okay? So uh, do credit scores for business startups differ according to the race and gender of the owner? Figure one shows that credit scores do differ by race. On average, startup businesses with Asian and white owners having higher than average credit scores. Those startups with African American and Latino owners have significantly lower credit scores. And it's important to note that these are startups. This is in their first year. So they haven't been um, going longer than their first year. Startups owned by whites have credit scores of 35.8 on average. Those owned by Asians have an average credit score of 39.5. In contrast, new businesses owned by African Americans have credit scores of 31.1. And those startup firms owned by Latinos have business scores of 32.9. African Americans and Latino owned businesses are significantly lower than white and Asian owned firms. Figure one also shows that startups owned by women have significantly lower credit scores, 33.2, than do new firms owned by men, 35.9. It is possible, however, that other factors such as firm characteristics explain these racial and gender differences in credit scores. To examine this possibility, we carried out a series of regression models predicting business credit scores of startups by race and gender while controlling for size of firm, industry type, type of ownership, education, age, et cetera. The stripe bars show what the credit scores for the various groups would be if the business owners were treated like whites and if women-owned businesses were treated the same as those owned by men. We used the blind of Oaxaca de decomposition to estimate what business credit scores would have been if they were determined in the same way as those for businesses owned by whites and by men. Figure two shows for black-owned businesses, the credit scores would increase from their actual credit score of 31.1 to 33.5. That would be a 7.8% increase in their credit scores, which for new businesses could mean the difference between qualifying for a loan or not. It could also mean getting a lower interest rate. For Latino-owned businesses, credit scores would go from 32.9 to 34.9. And for Asian-owned businesses, the scores would actually go down from 39.5 to 34.2. If credit scores for women-owned businesses were determined like those owned by men, credit scores would increase from 33.2 to 34.0. But when controlling for credit scores, so now we're gonna take credit scores into account. When controlling for credit scores, do the race and gender of new business owners affect their access to lines of credit? We again used the same decomposition to estimate what business lines of credit would be if all groups were treated like white business owners and male business owners. The stripe bars in figure four illustrate these results. 
In the case of black owned businesses, the credit lines would more than double from 2000 to 4000. For Latino owned businesses, lines of credit would nearly triple from 4000 to 13000. And for Asian owned businesses, lines of credit would more than triple from 6000 to 21000. If credit lines for women owned businesses were determined like those for those whose owners are men, the lines of credit would would be more than twice as large. In short, there are both substantial racial and gender differences in access to credit, net of credit scores. Needless to say, our results suggest that the determination of credit for new businesses is not colorblind. And perhaps even more disheartening is the idea that even with the same credit scores as whites and men, people of color and women receive significantly less in credit lines. In other words, minorities appear to be penalized in the determination of credit scores and again in access to credit lines. They appear to suffer discrimination both at the point of determining credit scores and at the point of lenders lending decisions. Thank you for your attention. Always a bad time when the first screen looks a little off. <laughs> that you know, there may be some translation errors across PowerPoint uh, formats, but um, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, uh, I'd I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to be part of these talks today, um, particularly jo Joey Brown, Rayshawn Ray, and Chris Marsh, and all the grad students who I know have been working hard to make this logistically possible. Um, and it's a wonderful honor to be here presenting with folks like Thomas Shapiro who I first read in grad school and whose work is um, framing my talk today, not to mention Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton, who are producing some of the most important policy relevant work on race and wealth inequality. And it's their work that allows me to, to now turn to look at debt. And I, I titled my presentation today, Black Debt, White Debt, as a kind of provocation to get us to start looking at the ways that debt looks different by race and what that means for your ability to build wealth. And looking at debt has been a through the looking glass experience, but I've found this way of thinking to be generative for understanding contemporary racial inequality. Today's economy is increasingly built around debt. In 2017, household debt surpassed our previous high of 12.7 trillion, which importantly was back in 2008, so the recession. Um, and so now it's up to $13.1 trillion. And when we to show the changing impact of debt on households is to show the interest they paid every year. So this graph starts back in 1946 and we're up to $800 billion just before the recession and it's heading back up again. So we don't know what 2017 looked like on this graph. Um, but that doesn't mean everyone experiences indebtedness in the same way. We need to understand how debt is creating new mechanisms that reproduce racial inequality. I really got started on this topic when my co-author, Raphael Sharon Chenier, and I wanted to know about the role of debt in the recent doubling of the racial wealth gap over the recession. And once we started kind of inductively looking at patterns in racial debt holding over this period, we were using consumer, survey of consumer finance data for black and white households, and we saw that only education debt rose overall for everyone over this period, that's the top graph, and also that black housing, credit, and vehicle debt, those are the purple, green, and blue lines um, in the bottom graph, all decreased relative to white families from 2001 to 2013. But black education debt overall rose relative to white. So that's the red showing that it's a higher ratio. Um, school debt now represents around $1.4 trillion of debt overall for American families, but it tripled for black families in 12 years. Here you can see that average student debt started rising faster for blacks than whites over this period. So the top graph is that, um, showing that rise of mean debt. Um, the second graph shows that black people's education debt 
tripled as a proportion of their overall household debt by 2013. And also, bo the bottom graph shows that far more households were being drawn into to debt. So um, by 2013, one in three black households held education debt as compared to only one in five whites. So what explains such ri rapid and racially targeted change? We know the cost of college is skyrocketing, but that wouldn't explain our race-specific findings. There's also an explosion of for-profit colleges targeting black students. But we argue you need to look at the loan's whole life course, not just the point of origination, but what happens after graduation. So you see a growth in secondary student loan industry products from loan servicing to securitization of student loans, just like with mortgages, which got us into a small problem. Um, and a stratification of outcomes, where 10 years after graduation, the racial debt gap has already tripled. Overall, our explanation was that a shifting terrain around education, and especially the financialization of education, has created an environment of what we call predatory inclusion. We define this as the inclusion of marginalized people into market segments they'd formerly been excluded from, but on terms that undermine the benefit of the inclusion. Just as predatory mortgages have taken advantage of black and Latino homeowners wanting a piece of the American dream from following the steps you're supposed to take to achieve economic mobility, we argue that the evidence on education debt indicates the same predatory inclusion is now happening there. The difference is that education debt can't be lost or forgiven even if you enter bankruptcy and sometimes even after you die. Um, however, I don't think this is only telling us about education debt, but showing us something larger about contemporary mechanisms of racial economic inequality. And here we can apply the work of Marion Forcade and Kieran, Kieran Healy on classification situations to race and debt. Their work looks at the financial industry's development of increasingly specific stratifications of consumers to be slotted into an also increasing array of financial products tailored for someone in their exact situation. They don't have to know your race to do this. Um, in fact, they probably don't want to know it officially so that they can avoid claims of discrimination, but they don't have to know it if they know your zip code and what you bought at the grocery store and what grocery store you were shopping at and all the other things that people now know about every consumer. Um, when black folks were excluded historically from mainstream debt products, the exploitation used to occur primarily at the local level through people like slumlords and contract sellers and loan sharks. And now that exploitation has been partly institutionalized with even mainstream institutions like Wells Fargo or Bank of America now offering fringier products for this market segment. And we need race scholars to be looking at the role of racial discrimination not only as a historical factor or a present day aberration. Racial difference can be an economically generative. While some people say racial discrimination is economically irrational, discrimination and its attendant features of exploitation form a fundamental part of late stage capitalism. And I wrote late racial capitalism, so I do wanna <laughs> say that correctly. Um, inequality is a raw product driving our 21st century industry. And algorithms are the machinery turning inequality into products. Not only are black and white customers steered into different debt products, debt is also going to have a really different role in your life depending on who you are. As for Codd and Healy note, classification situations are, quote, associated with distinctive experiences of debt. Some field way down are crushed by debt and others embrace credit as a means of asset accumulation and mobility, as we've been hearing a little about so far this morning. And we've also been hearing that fundamentally wealth is measured as um, your net assets minus all your debts. But I'm, what I'm trying to say today is that debt has an independent on, effect on people's lives, and so debt has to be considered as more than a number. It's a relationship, um, and that means we need to study it relationally, and we need to study it separately, disaggregated from wealth. Um, so we need to consider both how debt affects our measures of wealth and also how it actually affects people's lives. So I'm still working with Raf Sharon Chenier and now also with Tressie Cottom to look at how the debt experience looks qualitatively different by race. So that racial difference um, even occurs when you have the same debt as we've shown with education debt, but it also shapes which kinds of debt you take on. 
The primary wealth building mechanisms we see today, housing and education, can both serve to reproduce disadvantage for black people, and a main way that that happens is through debt. But we also want to talk about um, whose debt serves as an advantage. Um, uh, in the piece that just came out in context, which is um, produced here, um, and it's not on your list, so that's why I brought this up here. Um, uh, um, Raf and I talk about good debt and bad debt, and good debt and bad debt can be loosely read as white debt and black debt. Um, and, and, and as uh, was already mentioned by Dr. Herring, Donald Trump serves as my reference point for seeing how indebtedness is not always a hindrance or a problem. And as such, it can't, can't be always just evaluated as the opposite of your assets. So owing $8 billion, as Donald Trump did at one point, instead of $800, is not 10 million times worse for you. Um, good debt or white debt can be used as a tax write-off, as we heard with the mortgage interest deduction. Um, it can be leveraged to purchase appreciating assets based on the expectation of ever-rising income. It builds your credit score, allowing you to participate in the financial world. You can live large off good debt without actually ever getting out of debt. And when you're sick of holding it, you can erase it through bankruptcy. Um, even then, white debtors are more likely to use and be steered to the more forgiving form of bankruptcy, Chapter 7. This kind of debt is not morally stigmatizing, and that has real material consequences for people. Um, we, we show this descriptively in the context article um, that you might assume that as your debt goes up, your net worth goes, goes down. But this graph shows that as your debt goes up, so does your net worth. And the pink bars here represent millionaires, which are over half of the most heavily indebted population. So that's the top debt decile, number 10, on, on the right side. Um, and to understand this upside down world, um, you know, don't just believe me. Look at, look at how banks describe their customers and their portfolios. Banks describe maxed out credit accounts as mature, and they compete over them. That's why you're always getting invitations to you know, switch over your account from, from them to me. Um, as Mayor Sabaradaran pointed out recently, Banks refer to their customers' bank accounts as liabilities, and they call their outstanding loans assets. Um, meanwhile, bad debt, whether from a payday loan or car title loan company, rent-to-own store, can have a disproportionately large effect on your life, even though it's a smaller loan amount mo most of the time. Bad debt or black debt also includes the racially disproportionate and rising use of collection lawsuits for small consumer debts covered by Paul Keel and ProPublica, Municipalities increasing use of fines and fees for revenue generation, which along with bail have created modern debtors prison, and the intermingling of these financial and criminal justice worlds. And the impact of these smaller debts is really different. They're not leverageable to create more wealth. They represent the mountain you have to climb before you can even get back to the starting line. Um, so we're still trying to look at who's never, whose debts never come due and who gets castigated morally for debt. How do you consider multi-hundred million dollar loans in the same analytical frame as the explosion of these smaller debts? And those are the kind of questions we need to answer both like qualitatively, but they also reflect in our quantitative research as well. Um, thanks a lot. We'd like to thank all of our panelists. Can we give them one more round of applause, please? And I'm going to, so at this point, we're entering the q and I'm going to ask Dr. Herring to come up and provide some summative remarks. If you have any questions written out on your index card, please pass them down to the ends of the rows. And Kelsey and Paige will come and pick them up, and we'll begin the Q&A portion of this panel. Thank you all for coming. I would also like to thank the panelists. Extremely informative. Dr. Shapiro basically telling us about the explosion of debt in, in, in terms of the racial wealth gap, just an explosion over the decades, and the sources of it, historical, but also contemporary. Uh, Professor Henderson telling us about business, and as she said, this is an often overlooked kind of source of wealth. Uh, it does seem like it has paradoxical kinds of effects, though, that 
what you see for many people of color is that business ownership can be the engine towards indebtedness. And some of this can be because of uh, the inability to get working capital, because of credit, because of credit lines and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, we know that those people who tend to be extremely wealthy in our nation often are business owners. And if they're not business owners, they're shareholders of businesses. And uh, Dr. Seamster telling us about debt. And if you're like me, you have thought of debt as being something to be avoided, something that is really bad. But maybe it's just because I haven't gotten enough of it. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> is that <laughs> if I can figure out a way of leveraging my debt, um, <laughs> then it might be much better. Uh, and to, to know that not just wealth, but debt is also racialized. And so I know that I am looking forward to learning much, much more about the racialization of indebtedness and how that plays out in American society. Um, I won't speak about my own stuff, uh, our own stuff, but uh, you heard what I said. Okay. <laughs> and I am awaiting those questions. <laughs> you have one. You have one coming. All right. Should I ask people questions? Uh, they say, do not ask them questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We had people from Primerica earlier. This is not, I, I don't think this is a question from Primerica, but it's one that is probably relevant. Have any of the panelists looked at the role of financial education in the home on wealth inequality, specifically the disparities in financial socialization of black slash brown children? And so this is basically framing this in a way that Honestly, I don't think any of, any of the panelists talked about, because most of the panelists are talking about what, in sociology, I think you refer to them as structural issues that undergird wealth inequality. And this is one that is perhaps talking along the lines of what people might think of as being a more cultural explanation of wealth disparities. And so have any of, oh, I, okay, have any of you? <laughs> Looked at uh, people, people are looking at me. Can, 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 am I being heard here? Um, microphone. Now it's Justin. Yeah, sounds all right. Sounds better. I'll, I'll, I'll hold on. So a, a couple of points. Um, this is where I think uh, s culture and structure really intersect. Um, and I think very specifically on when we think about what uh, some people call financial education takes place in the home. That is, what's the dinner table talk about? Um, what do you hear at the social club, at the country club, on the playground, at the barber shop? Um, differs. <laughs> um, and it's part of one's, uh, if you will, common uh, class and racial exper life experience uh, that we learn. And uh, where some of us have to go to formal classes to learn things that others of us are, are, are taught at the dinner table. So I, I think, uh, and there has been some work, uh, uh, some, some work done. I'm not sure I can cite it off the top of my head. Maybe, maybe other people can as well. Um, that's one observation. The other observation I would like to make, um, and I want to be a little careful here um, because the data is, is still, is, is not conclusive yet. Um, uh, financial education standalone, like implicit bias training standalone, one day Starbucks type session, tall and blonde and mokey, um, don't work. Um, there's very little stickiness to those sessions. That is, not much is learned and taken as part of one's life experience days, weeks, months, years afterwards. 
the best kind of financial education that has that kind of stickiness tends to be the financial education that happens when people need to learn something, like buying a house for the first time, or filing for bankruptcy, or, or doing X, Y, and Z. Um, it, it's seen more, the metaphor is more like uh, college extension. You go there for a reason. You're motivated, and you learn, and you leave. And you take that learning with you. Um, so the, the uh, end of the day, at this point, um, coming from the Consumer Protection Bureau and others who've, who've been doing a lot of this work, um, the best place for financial education is situational. Um, and that's the best, the best chance it has. Um, and we should not think of it as a one day uh, uh, do this course and you're going to learn about the miracle of compound interest. Um, thanks for the question. Um, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's either too far or too close. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why we uh, thought it was important to show the change over time in our paper on student debt. Be and I, and because it shows, to me, like the racial wealth gap doubling over the recession period is an indicator that we can't just look at cultural factors to understand what happened. Because clearly, um, you know, families didn't wake up over this period and suddenly start socializing their children differently about um, debt or specifically about education debt. And so to me, that, that's kind of um, saying we need to, <laughs> we're saying probably these cultural factors were held mostly constant over this time. So, so like let's look at the structural changes that could have driven the change. Um, another, another thing I would say about financial education is that um, what, what the panel is showing today is that the effects of doing the same things do not have the same consequences, whether that's applying for a business loan or going to college or buying a house. Um, and at e each little step in the way, <laughs> you go look at, okay, what about this piece? What about this piece? Each step in the way has these multiplying effects. That means that if you, if you provided just financial literacy education, you can't have one size fits all advice because they're not, it's not gonna play out the same way in people's lives. Um, and, 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 and lastly, that, that um, you know, that, that these things, you know, it's not just that uh, black folks don't know about the nicer form of bankruptcy where, <laughs> where it doesn't stigmatize you as much and, and where you don't have to pay as much back. Um, there, there was experiments done where lawyers were steering Reggie and Lakeisha to the more onerous form, chapter 13 <laughs> of bankruptcy, saying that they needed to learn a lesson and they needed to be, um, this was good for them because it would show that they were responsible. But, you know, Jody and Brad are in smart for doing chapter seven because it shows that they know how to manage their debt well and that they can like figure out the best advantage. And so um, we really, <laughs> that's why we need sociology to really read through like how people are viewing this debt and, and wealth and how, um, and that it's not just a matter of you didn't know about it because you weren't in the right um, private club. Until I get the next question, I guess I'll also say, uh, I don't think anyone is against uh, financial education, but if you uh, combine financial education with some actual resources to invest, I think people would be way better off. So let's just try it that way. Okay. okay. So I have a question for... Dr. Shapiro, and the questioner asked, what are some of the factors that lead to this 90 cents of wealth per dollar for African American people versus the $4 of wealth for white people? So um, let, me, let me go back to the, the context of, of, of that data. Um, uh, and, and with that piece of data, we were asking, uh, asking the question, um, between, uh, with the same set of families, same set of individuals, between 1984 and 2013, um, as their income increased, what was the relationship between 
that increase in income to their wealth. Okay. And so it's a long period of time. Um, so the increase in income can, you know, even adjusted for inflation for some families can look large. And what the, what the data showed us was that for whites at the median, for every dollar of increase in income over that long period of time, their wealth increased by, by four to five dollars. And for African Americans, their wealth increased about 90 cents, if I recall the data accurately. The part of the question is why? Why doesn't a dollar increase in income convert or reward wealth the same way no matter, no matter race? Um, asking the question that way totally strips the context and the history and the legacy out of, out of the equation. Um, part of the equation, um, and I'm going to refer to, to um, uh, a paper that we did in conjunction with the Federal Reserve Bank of, of St. Louis where um, some of us in the room really pushed the St. Louis uh, Fed Reserve Bank on a finding that was prematurely announced. And their finding was that um, college educated, that is whites with college degrees, over a good period of time their wealth increased dramatically, as one might suspect. But when they looked at African Americans with college degrees, their wealth actually declined over the same period of time. And unfortunately, they, they put that out <laughs> um, without pushing on, on uh, understanding a little bit better why that might be the case. So they commissioned a, a set of papers, um, including two of those of uh, sitting, uh, Dr. Hamilton's team and my team did one. And I think Dr. Darity ended up moderating the session, did an incredible job. And what, what my team was able to show was that um, it tends to be the case, and I hit my, underline my generality, it tends to be the case. When African Americans are economically successful, they are the most successful in their kinship and family network. And others in that network who do you ask for money or resources when you need help? You go to those that have the largest window to be able to help you. And so we were able to show by looking uh, uh, at the panel study of income dynamics over periods of time that in fact the frequency of giving financial resources among African American and Hispanic families is greater than it is for white families. Now, I'm not going to make the case that, that, that black and brown families are more charitable because of that. I'm going to make the case that it's about the window and it's about the opportunity, it's about the network, and it's about the kinship network. Now, having said that, the amount of money was among whites who give money to kin and families much greater. Now, a translation of that, I, I'm firmly convinced, is that it raises a question for us. And in this field, if you will, those of us that deal in race and wealth and in the so-called asset field, the unfortunate metric is measuring wealth at time one versus wealth at time two. And we make the statement, if it's gone up, something's been done right, and we'll figure it out. I would suggest that the data we were looking at tells us the story that Actually, African-American college graduates' income increased greater than white college graduates, but their wealth went down because they were helping family members. They were helping the niece into community college. They were helping an aunt, a, a mother, a grandmother with, with health care. Right? And they also were not positioned in jobs that um, had access to pension and match and seated pensions and all kinds of other things that magnify wealth. So for a lot of reasons like that and others, um, that gets us in again to the pipeline and the pathway of how wealth is created or debt is created differently according to racial and socioeconomic context. Thank you. Well, I've been informed to thank you for your questions but we don't have time for the answers. And so 
that'll be it for this panel. So thank you for your attention. Thank you all very much. Um, as I said, unfortunately, this panel is ended for now. Um, stick around. We have about 15 minutes until the next one begin. You may be able to catch the panelists while they're here. Um, thank you for coming, and just hold tight until the next panel begins.